Hello, Rail friends. Welcome to our first podcast. It's Mike and Casey here in the studio. We have a special guest, Josie. And today, I didn't even tell you this yet, this is Josie's 11th birthday. So Josie's my dog. My wife and I have had her since a year before we got married. So uh, she's getting to be an old girl, but they live a long time. So we still have some good years with Josie left. And Mike, you have a dog. That's her name's older. Harley, and she just turned 15 in December on the 23rd. And she's a Skipper Key, which is a kind of unusual dog, but there was one in the dog show this year on Thanksgiving. And I said, oh, look, a Skipper Key. Always makes us excited when we see one, because you and your wife have had Harley for years. Yes. That's before she's you been married, right? Ten plus years, and she is my seventh rescue. Seventh Skipper Key rescue. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we are both dog people, but you see Josie sometimes, because Josie can continually sit in a small spot in a truck, and Harley gets a little bit more excited. And Harley just wants to hang out the window and go. Yep. Okay, so I know I didn't really tell you what we're doing today, Mike. Uh, I just like to throw Mike in the middle of things to see how he reacts. But uh, it's 24 degrees outside for the high with a low of 11. And for southeast Tennessee, right on the Georgia border, it's about as cold as it gets. So we did not feel like spending a lot of time standing in the wind today. I thought, what better time to talk about Rail Moments, the channel, and uh, talk about being Rail fans in... One of the best cities to be a rail fan, Chattanooga, Tennessee, the general area where Mike and I both live, and it's a great spot to watch some trains. And we've learned a lot in the past almost two years we've had this channel. It's been yeah. extremely educational. Uh, when did you start watching trains with your son? Mm, I'm approximately 93 when we first moved here and we discovered the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum. Greatest place on the planet to, to have family fun, grow up, and all the different things that, that we shared from there forward. And I enjoy going trackside, but my time to go trackside is more limited these days than the mics is, so I spend a lot of time in the studio. And yours, a lot of your time is spent in the chase, especially of the heritage units. Mm. A lot of my time is spent uh, editing. I spend most of my life in Premiere, I feel like. It takes about four times as long to edit the video as the run length of the video. So if we make uh, like that, the Southern Heritage Union video that was, uh, it was an hour and a half long. Mm -hmm. It actually took me about 10 hours to edit, and that's not including the six hours I spent, and then I accidentally didn't save it. Like, the safe word was, was a bad day when we realized that all that was gone. I called you, and I was just beside myself. And like, it's gone. I'm like, what's gone? I'm like, that video. Like, what? Like, what's gone? What did you, what'd you lose? I'm like, everything. That's everything we did. <laughs> All of it. All of it. So I had to literally start over from the beginning. Um, and I learned an important thing about the way the Premiere processes autosaves that day. And now I'm very paranoid. And if you look at my edits, you'll see, say, five, six, seven, eight along the way. So anyway, let's jump into it. Let's talk a little bit about the videos we've done and our favorite things about them and what we thought. So I've prepared some of our videos. Mike, I haven't even shown you this yet. We're going to go through some of our videos and talk about them. This is our first video. We did it in 2022, in April of 22, and I think we actually shot this sometime in February and took a while to get the edits and get it right. This is the very first one. As you saw in the bloopers, that's when Casey was trying to teach me subscribe, like, and send comments. It also is funny because we caught an executive uh, unit, which we call the heritage unit. We didn't know back then the difference between the executive and a heritage. But we didn't realize BNSF doesn't really have heritage. This was an executive engine. And what went by after the train was gone, it was like, Casey, what was that? I don't know. It's black and white. That's so weird. And Maybe it was old. different. <laughs> Maybe it's old. We didn't know. We didn't know what it meant. Here you are in the front yard. It was a good time. We enjoyed that. That video, I think, was really cool because we discovered Coheta. And we also discovered the fact there was an ice cream shop next door, mm -hmm. which was amazing. You'd been to Coheta before. Yeah, and now it's an ice cream shop. It's an old bank, and everything's still there from back in the time. It's very, very historic. And uh, so that's one of our favorite places to go. And we get ice cream, and then we go to the old general store there and have great food, and, and I love going there for sandwiches. It's a good spot. It's one of our emotional favorites, so we like the whole area. Uh, this wasn't the most exciting shooting a video we've ever done, but it was cool that on our very first effort, we caught a BNSF executive, even if we didn't know what it was. I've thought about re-editing this video a bunch because we kept all of our raw footage from every video we've ever shot. 
and I think we had five cameras on this, six cameras. We had a lot on, on this particular video. You know, one of the most memorable things for me on that was Casey had to get after me. The camera goes this way, not this way. Mike filmed a lot of his early video vertical, which is fine if you're doing that uh, for TikTok or shorts or something. It's not as much fine if you're doing uh, landscape coverage. So there was a lot of stuff to learn. Um, and Mike was using, we had a lot of different cameras, but you were using a phone that day and uh, we progressed through everything from DSLR cameras to 360 phones. We've tried everything. And what's the quickest, what's the best quality, and what can we use to pan quickly and get the action and make sure that we're delivering what you guys want to see in the fastest way possible. And I always thought all Casey would do is just bring it to the studio, put it together, throw it out there. I just want to learn that it's way more complex. And some of the things I did by changing this and that is like, no, Mike, don't do that anymore. <laughs> There were some of those. And some things made it easier. We got you a clapper board. Mm -hmm. And Mike at first was like, okay, well, does this just make us look more official? Like, why do I why do I do this? Why do I run on this? And then he learned it so I can synchronize the audio because we have multiple audio feeds for any given device. We can synchronize the cameras. It makes it much faster for me to be able to edit. So just little things that we learned a long time. But clapper board, that was an important one. And then even after all the time I've been using it, the other day I was watching him do one of the heritage engines that we had and I had my hand over the top of the white and that's the problem. I never realized just how important it was until Casey showed me what it does in the production. So no more hand over the color board. The other, my other favorite part is if Mike forgets to use the clapper board, he will yell clap, which does a similar thing. I can see a little spike in the audio and I can sync it up. There was one day he was so excited to see the Southern coming around the corner. Here's the Virginian. I think it's probably both to be honest. Both. He gets so excited to see this heritage at locomotive coming around the corner that he claps the clapper board and then yells clap because he's so excited he forgot he already hit the clapper board. But I enjoy those little moments in the studio, stuff you don't normally get to see. Uh, it did make the blooper real, but most people would have no idea why he suddenly yells clap, but I busted out laughing, made my side hurt. This is our second video. This actually came out the day after our very first video. We were really bold. And it's amazing um, how much better some of our production is, considering it was the second day. We were very much learning, trying to get the feel of the camera down. I didn't realize that we actually shot this intro on the same day as we shot the previous video's intro. I didn't realize that until watching this back. And that's bad when I thought, well, I'll just make notes and hang them over here. So, because I, I got so nervous in the beginning that I was going to make a mistake or something. So, back at that point, I was trying to tape the notes up on the camera and then the wind would come along and then I would be able to read the note in the middle of it. So. I also love that one of the things you're doing here that you're already doing is you're getting the arm coming down. You've always loved getting the arm. And I, I enjoy seeing the signals come down. It's that the drama you see if you roll up on one. It's that moment, you know, it's just you're watching the ice cream hit the cone and then the cone comes to you. When that rail comes down and the red lights hit, it's that moment that you've been, is, is this the catch or is this the one that you've been after and, and you get that one. So that's our first roll up, which I didn't realize we made our first roll up the day after we made our first video. <laughs> because we've been filming for three or four months by this point, but we were, we were trying to figure out what was going to be the most interesting. We were trying different angles, trying all kinds of different things. And this is uh, just an endless train of auto rides, but it did have some great graffiti. Uh, there were some funny moments. A lot of this day ended up in our our first blooper reel. It was a good day. We enjoyed it. It was our first day going out at dawn. <laughs> and not only that, it's, it's going and seeing the, the blooper video. That's when I realized that, no, we're not in Georgia. We're in Tennessee. It was my favorite. Yeah, you did have no, no idea what's favorite. Actually, it's the other way around. That's the day I realized that we were actually in Georgia, not Tennessee. And Casey pointed it out for me, as you saw in the blooper video. I enjoyed that too. Now, this video actually turned out to be our most organically popular long video. Uh, this was The General, and I think part of it was the connection to The General. It was also exciting because this, we actually drive past Mike's neighborhood, and this Mike lives in Georgia, and yeah, so this is fun. This is our stomping ground. It basically goes from where I live to where Mike lives. We live uh, about 15 minutes apart, uh, but Mike lives in Georgia, and I live in Tennessee. We're both in the general Chattanooga area, but this is very central to the culture of Chattanooga. And this video 
is about the general and the great locomotive chase, but everybody still talks about it. Uh, the famous Choo Choo has kind of a tribute locomotive to the general that sits there uh, right inside the door. There's a lot of things that are connecting to this area, but then there's also the general monument, the actual spot. And I live on the CSX line, the main line now, which was one of the sections of track that actually uh, was in the great locomotive chase. And they, this was written in the description of my house. When I bought my house, they said, it's on the track once used in the great locomotive chase. And I thought, hmm, the old WNA. And now it's a CSX main line. I do like the um, opening screen we used for this one. And we are looking up. I always wondered how YouTubers get those kind of shots. We're actually watching the drone take off of the table. And you have a particular face because you were concerned it may drift toward, <laughs> toward your face. It was a, it was a challenging day. That was my old Jeep. That was. I sold that Jeep to a friend of ours, and unfortunately it was totaled in a crash just about a month ago. But we really liked that Jeep, and Mike and I would use it as a platform so we could stand up in the back of it. I remember this part. There's an old couch laying there, so I'm trying to position so that the couch isn't in our picture that someone has tossed out beside the road. And there's a manhole cover. There's yes. a gas escaping from the manhole cover. And the manhole cover is right at the top of the road, and so you can hear it. It's bouncing. Uh, and that was really distracting to like, figure out what was happening. All right, that was the general video. The next video, this was um, a shot much later. We actually shot this video right after I graduated and was no longer in school. We shot this new one and we put up this footage pretty quickly. So this is in Lookout Valley. It's mm -hmm. next to the Wahatchee CSX yard. It's where three tracks come together and we catch Norfolk Southern, a Union Pacific, um, and it's their intermodal. Unfortunately, intermodals are like watching paint dry sometimes. I think they're the only thing more boring is a cold train. Uh, especially cold train empties coming by. <laughs> that is. Yeah, but this, and we enjoyed this one. This was a three part series. We actually only recorded, we only put up two of the three parts. And I always think one day I'm going to go put up the third one just so I can have that sense of completion. Because at the end of part two, I say third part coming soon. And we actually never did put up the third part because then we'd seen a lot of other exciting things and started chasing heritage units. And this was filmed on your way to work one morning outside mm -hmm. your house. I said, Mike, we don't have an intro. And going back to the Lookout Valley one, we didn't realize how lucky we were at that point because those were the tracks side by side for both Norfolk Southern and CSX and everything the way the geographical lays here in Chattanooga, everything going east, west, and literally north, south afterwards, once they go past, all go through that one point where we were. Yeah. And we had at that point, we really didn't realize all the different things. And now how lucky we are, how exciting it is that that one place you can see just about everything that comes to Chattanooga. Yeah, it's a squeeze point because it's mm -hmm. got to get around the river and around the mountains and come into the large rail yards in Chattanooga, which is still a rail hub. And it's got Norfolk Southern's second largest classification yard. There's a lot that happens here. Also, that track right next to this one is from 1922, if I remember correctly. And so it just, just, hit turned... just, on it, just hit 100 years. Yeah. That's the day Casey showed me how to read a track and what month it was made and what year it was done and where it was actually uh, forged. So Union Pacific, we see those fairly often uh, come through on the Norfolk Southern tracks and we occasionally will catch a uh, BNSF, but most of our Locomotives are one here are either Norfolk Southern or CSX. Some good graffiti on this train. I've always wanted to make a graffiti highlight because we see some really impressive graffiti. I'll get to that at some point, but it obviously takes a lot of work because you have to watch a lot of hours of rail footage. And sometimes we'll have cameras on both sides of the train, so you end up watching both sides to try and catch the good graffiti. There's some really impressive artistry on some of these. And since Casey and I have learned at that particular intersection or, or where they come parallel at that point, once you go to the south of there, it takes many of the trains to go to some of the most historic, and they call it the historic eight depots in Alabama. And most of the trains that go past this point 
some at some point spur off from there. The one goes down to Fort Payne across to Birmingham. The other one goes down down to Nickajack and then goes south to Bridgeport. And then they start branching off to different places from Nashville all the way over to Huntsville in that area in Decatur. I like that telephoto shot because one thing that I didn't find a way to highlight, which you can see in the video, is you can see the signal change from yellow to red right as the locomotive passes it. I enjoyed that shot. I was glad that I set up a dedicated zoom lens just for that shot that day. But I didn't really find any way to highlight it or to point it out. I remember that day when we were finished, the, there was a train sitting coming in eastbound and he stopped there at the crossing for the signal and then we waited and we waited and he was still there and Casey said it's time to go and it's like we can't leave him we you know, just we can't leave one on base we've got to wait for him to go and Casey goes Mike it's dark we can't film him anymore it's yeah even with editing he had the last footage of it is so dark you can you can barely see it so reluctantly Casey drove me home from there I think we filmed this one on New Year's weekend of 23. I remember it was very cold and very windy. And we just determined that was the day we were going to film. And we went to the Waffle House to warm up for a while and shot our some of our footage in the Waffle House. But, man, it was cool. I always ask Casey, as you're sitting there watching go by, you look at the different graffiti, and it's like, how do they get that high? How many cans of paint do they take down to the... To wherever the train's sitting and and just the artistic ability and some of the different things that are on the side of the trains that you see are just so incredibly interesting i've found and then we saw top cat one day tisk 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 such selfishness we did see top cat again that's in a later video i think we'll be seeing that one here in a minute matter of fact let's go to the next video here's part two this one was my first studio intro the reason being we had shot a whole lot of footage that day. We were on the tracks all day long with multiple cameras. But one thing we didn't do was record an intro for making it a multi-part. Because I told Mike, I said, this is going to be an extremely long video. Why don't we split this into two or three pieces? And so I made a little intro sitting actually right where the camera is sitting currently at the uh, production desk. Back then I only had two screens, different computer. But we weren't even editing 4K video at the time. Um, our videos were still 1080 and that computer could handle it. Eventually it could not handle the long 4k. And it was actually the, the video of the Southern in 4k that killed it. <laughs> I had to upgrade significantly to be able to handle editing video that long. I like that shot with the arm coming down and I'm actually in the distance. I'm where the car is in the distance. I'm filming from one side and like you're filming from the upper side and we were using radios to communicate, but we're actually not even close to each other. I remember I, this is one of the ones that was kind of a favorite when we first got started. And the reason being is looking back at this, this, this is one of my favorite moments because again, as I said earlier, there's so many special people and interesting people that you've met along the way. And the gentleman that owns the metal company where that driveway is, it was a Saturday and he'd come to open the office and he had his, little son, probably two or three years old at that point, and they had a deuce and a half mm -hmm. type military vehicle that he was taking down to fuel and what have you, and he was spending the day with his son, and he was telling me how much his son enjoyed seeing the trains go by their office, and it's just one of those little moments that you never really get to share, but it was just special because that was a bond that he shared, and that was the same thing I found that I had with my son. This was our first time using drone shots in a, in a final mm -hmm. edit. And it's helpful, especially with the empty coal cars, because empty coal cars, as we said, are like watching paint dry. But if you can see inside them, it's, it's much more interesting, especially the hopper cars. But I enjoy this because in some of the hopper cars in this video, you can actually see what's inside them. And in some of them, they have really interesting stone. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. rough cut granite or what. There's some interesting stuff in the hopper cars. But these are just empty coal cars. And... Uh, the only way I could even make sense of them in the edit, you know, obviously there's multiple cameras, but I'm trying to show it the whole time. And the only ones I could do were the ones that were rusty or where they were facing backwards or whatever to make it all line up. This was difficult to edit. And that's where, and when Casey first showed me the drum video, 
it was like, how cool is that to see the inside? You know, it's just something you never get to do or you never really kind of realize just what all is in there or what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those moments like that is really, really interesting. And I was always big on making sure we did everything the right way and do it legally. And so trying to make sure that we were um, on the correct property line. And I was trying to explain to Mike how Part 107 license works and all the regulation about where you can operate drones. That's why there's not drone footage and everything. Sometimes we're not a place where we can't. And I actually used to do this all the time. We, the, we would show the locomotives and we would give all the info on each locomotive. And it was very time consuming to find all this info. But I later learned that apparently a lot of people really enjoyed seeing that detail. So we may start doing that again. But I stopped doing it just because it was so time consuming. And that's one of the things that going into this, I was surprised when Casey started putting that up, just how long some of these locomotives have been in service. That just amazes me. Especially the little yard locomotives. They will, a lot of times they'll be from 1972. I mean, we're talking 50 plus years of operation. Even one of the Heritage Norfolk Southerns, the Erie Lackawanna, it's a 1972 EMD. I enjoyed seeing them come around the curb. I'm glad you got that shot. And actually that merges, there's a drone shot that I have from just about the same spot, but slightly over the trees. And it looks almost the same, except for the, the height of it. There were some fun shots that day. A lot of challenge to edit. I think that's why I never finished part three. It's still, still sitting somewhere on a hard drive, partially edited. Okay, this was another Rail Moments roll up. Um, this one was in Apison. This was later on. You had actually taken a break from filming for a while because you got really busy at work and you hadn't filmed anything in three or four months. And this was one of the first times that you went back out and you found a new spot in Apison that you really enjoyed. I think it was a spot you used to go sit and watch trains with your son. You hadn't really thought about filming mm -hmm. and you found a little bridge. And this was uh, dressed just down the street from that bridge. And we have sat here quite a few times. It's Howardsville Road, and it's known, the next segment's known as Long. And at that point, right after, on the other side of this is where the switch goes. The end of the segment goes back to just one uh, rail line. And the exciting has a lot of different things on, but that is probably one of the neatest places that I found as we started on this, because you get to see so many things happen there, the different trains that come and hold there. And then to start to learn the intricate pieces of how they pass and move from one another and to watch the signals drop. I just, I really, really enjoy this place. And it's on a grade. So the direction he's going, he's climbing the hill and you can hear him really working hard. And they are generally slowing as they go up the hill, as they approach uh, the entry to the yard, I'm guessing. Or is it a curve? And this, they do the switch and then they go on up past Apison, uh, past College to Allen Udwa, and then uh, eventually into the Debutch Yard. So they're slowing, I guess, with a curve as they come around here. But then going the other way, they're accelerating, so you get to hear them picking up speed. And it, it's a fun place to sit and watch. It is sometimes less dynamic to film because you don't necessarily know what's coming. There's not a lot of early warning. I think the uh, Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum's camera is about the only warning you have of what's going to be coming, mm -hmm. but it can be challenging to know what's on the on the tracks before it arrives. But it's a good spot to sit, relax, and your coffee. What do you, you, have, you have the TV RM rail camera to the actually would be the northwest of there, and then you have the Dalton camera uh, directly south from this point. So you do get to find out ahead of time what's coming. And with the lights right there, you get to see the when they drop the green segment. So you get a little bit of an indication. So I, I enjoy that part of it there. The next video, this one was our first dedicated short. We had made shorts that were intros, uh, but this is a... Sable, I think, is the proud sorry, pronunciation for it, but... Schnabel or Schnabel, either way. I remember the day I got this. I was so excited. I called Casey. I said, Casey, Casey, in my normal, excited manner. It's like, I don't know what I got, but it's really cool, and it's got a caboose. And I looked it up, and it turns out these things are, are heavy lift cars, and they are interesting. They usually carry large transformers, sometimes uh, wind turbine blades. They'll carry really large segments. But part of the highlight is they have their own sort of dedicated routes. Think of it like a wide load 
truck with a pilot car, but in this case, it's a locomotive and a special car. And these cars can hold over a million pounds, but they have the caboose as part of their operations team and they are going on dedicated routes. They often have priority. Other trains will sit on the siding tracks to let them through. And in this case, it really did. There were two trains that sat on the siding track, but, but it's neat to see it come through. It's something very different. So then the very next day, Mike, I had gone to South Carolina for work and Mike called me. It was in my hotel room and he was in an absolute beside himself panic. You were saying one of your employees had called and that a train had hit an excavator mm -hmm. right by your house. Yes. That we, the first question is, okay, is everybody okay? You know, is this something we should go film because it's, you know, machine versus machine? Or is this something we should avoid because there's kind of an injury or, or we don't want to be those people who tag on. But if it's machine versus machine, let's go film it. And so Mike zipped over there and we shot what was still our number one video of all time. This one got us, I think, 700 subscribers so far and 500 and something comments that's been watched. Um, and people around the globe watched. Oh yeah, about I was just, just amazed. About a third of a million people have watched it from Russia and China and Mexico and India and everybody's watched this. But part of what's distinctive, yes, we are using uh, footage that we found from the internet, but we actually were there very, very shortly after this happened. We actually beat some of the cops to the scene. I still can't believe, number one, that the excavator stayed attached to that trailer, but number two, just the, the crazy impact of hundreds of tons of train, thousands of tons of train hitting Air 60 ton excavator. And as you saw in that video, the presence of mind for the driver that he got out to unhook they pull the pin between the trailer and the truck. Mm -hmm. It really did help save the train too, and it saved it from derailing, but also saved his truck from getting flipped over. And it separated the cover of the counterweight, but believe it or not, most of it survived. And very little damage to the engines. I think, no, actually there were no injuries. I don't believe right. this one. There was one guy who um, got a little bit bonked from the sudden braking, but there wasn't really any injury in the locomotive itself was pretty much fine. They took mm -hmm. off shortly thereafter. Once everybody was done, they took off. You know, the cops cleared them and the, the rail cops left and off it went. With a different crew, I will say. I guess I don't know if they timed out or they just needed a day off after that, but it was, it was quite an impact. Then shortly after this, this was a, we had started running our live cam and I just happened to notice out the window from my house, I saw this military train go by and I called Mike and he zipped over at full speed and just caught it. I mean, you were there seconds before him, which happens a lot with us. And when he says just, I mean, literally, as I arrived, the lights came on. Yeah, so when you see the lights in the beginning, I have edited it to the moment when his, his camera stops moving and then it's less than two seconds you see the locomotives come by. This was really interesting. One of the things that we caught, and I didn't realize what I was seeing at first, we caught some prototypes. And the day that we filmed this, these were still prototypes. And then they released them uh, within, I think, the five days it took us to get everything edited and get the final video out. So we made a short and then this full length one. By the time we figured out what we were seeing, they had just released the contract and these were no longer prototypes that were entering full production. But there's some interesting little uh, GM military trucks on here that at the time we shot them were still prototypes and they were mm -hmm. just a handful of operation. There's also some really cool hardware with Avenger missiles on it. Definitely something different from the normal one. And we've since seen lots of military trains, but this one had quite a variety. Matter of fact, we got one about two weeks ago that uh, went down the same track. And then shortly after this video, we finally hit 1,000 subscribers. I remember this day well, we were filming at Tin Bridge. We were using the drone. It was quite windy and Josie, my dog, with me. Uh, we were in my old truck trying to film from the back of the truck and it was uh, quite a day for logistics and it was also tax weekend and I married a CPA oh, yeah. so I was, I was trying to make myself scarce and did not want to be around the house on yeah. tax weekend. So we had gone out to film and during the course of that day I got to radio Mike and say hey come up here we just hit a thousand subscribers. It was a good day we made this short little video there I'm holding my dog and this was really just a cell phone. We used a magnet mount attached to my truck. <laughs> but a little short vertical video to say thank you. And that was a that was a fun day for us. 
This next one, this was sad. We debated for a long time exactly how to approach this. So Mike had gone out and caught a lot of footage right after this derailed, and this is just up the road. The day that this actually happened, we had filmed some footage, but the real police were really trying to discourage people from being around. And one of the clips of this video, I actually know the guy, Ryan, who filmed it, and I give him credit in the video, but one of these two people I actually know. So we were all in and around this, but we weren't sure exactly how to approach it, and we didn't want to go violate private property or, or get in any place we weren't supposed to. But then you did go film shortly after when they started clearing it up, they cleared the tracks, and you were able to be in a safe spot where the rail police were going to be happier with you to film some of this. And then you met a gentleman who was a still photographer who got a lot of shots, and we included those shots in this video with his permission. We gave him credit for it. It was very nice of him. He sent us a file with all the high-resolution photos, and we picked them out and merged them in with Mike's footage here. And this was a memorable moment for me because you just don't realize the magnitude of the pieces of equipment, the size, the weight, until you actually see it there and you're close to it and, and just how dwarfing the size is to you uh, in comparison and, and what's going by. And and that was, as I sat and looked at that and, and walked along the road and what have you there, it was, you, you realize just how much weight and, and there is that, with a train that's going past you. Huge destructive force. We ended up following these locomotives for a long time. We caught them as they were being taken out of town to get repaired. We caught them going by the crossing of Jersey Pike. We also got one of them, but once it was back in service, we've been trying to pay attention to when they all come back through. But uh, we saw them sitting where they were being stored. We accidentally found them uh, behind a business around the middle of nowhere in the woods. And we weren't even looking for them. We just happened to have found where they were. If you ask my wife what's one of the most memorable moments that she's watched on the different filmings that we have, and it's not on the blooper reel, but, and, and again, I, I would get so excited when something was occurring, and we're right by the Little Debbie's plant there in Collegedale, and as I'm getting ready to do my intro, and again, I get all excited, I call it Little Debbie's Little Dummies, and my wife hasn't let me live that down since. I wish I'd done that. I would have put it in my blue career. You must have deleted that one before I got it. Unfortunately, you haven't found it yet. Sometimes Mike deletes things, and I can see the deleted files, but they remain on the camera for a while. But I'm not bringing them over right now. I'm thinking maybe. Yeah, yes, it's another 21st century thing that Casey has taught me. <laughs> you can't hide it even in the trash. This was our first dedicated shot of Heritage when we started filming Heritage units. I don't think this was the first one you ever saw. But this is the first one that we got because it was leading and we said okay well let's take this one and so this uh this lehigh valley and this was a really interesting one part of why we caught it is it's the lead locomotive of six it was a seriously heavy duty train that was coming through that day and it was windy you could see it blowing your hair and the microphones were struggling but we managed to clean up the audio enough to get it decent and this this was a turn point for me too because to me it was just another engine in the beginning because i didn't understand the the rich heritage behind the actual meaning of the heritage engines and how they represent the fallen flags for the different lines and just how unique each of the engines are and after catching the lehigh and then looking more into it it just, it was, it was very, very intriguing to me. And, and now we have a mission to find all 21 of them, including the forgotten one. In the Erie like a one out stays in New Jersey in a rail yard. And at this point, I think we're up to 14 of the 20. And there are only three or four that are actually on the channel. Um, one of the things we do is we will film the same locomotive multiple times and then we'll make different shots of it. Because one of the things we like to capture is both sides of it are different lighting conditions. So. We have a lot of footage that's on the hard drive that hasn't made it to the channel yet, but part of that's because we will film multiple days before we actually mm -hmm. release a video. And sometimes you can tell or we'll, we'll put a lapse through there that shows it's a different spot or a different day, but sometimes they're months apart in the footage we actually captured. Okay, this was the first time that we ever did this. Um, you went off on your own. I had actually gone past this building shortly on a work trip 
And I drove past it and I said, what is that thing? And I had done extensive searching and I was looking at maps. So I'm trying to move the map around and figure out what is this building and realized it was Cincinnati's Union Terminal. And you went up there shortly thereafter on a random day. And it turns out it was museum day. It was museum day. And he just happened to pick that day. And this was museum day in 2023. A lot of old cars, history, there's a model train in there that runs the old route. One of our favorite things of this is talking about the fountain and why the fountain's there and why they located the terminal in that particular spot it was interesting. And this was Mike Alcello, who was really walking around with a just a monopod. He was that guy walking around the museum with a monopod, but it worked. Required a little stabilization here and there. You know, we, we started with the Canadian geese on the grass out front and then on up to the fountain. And then from there, and, and, and I still kid Casey, going to a chicken place with no chicken because this beautiful facility and all the different things there are to look at, there's no trains going past or that you can see while you're there. Just the, the points from the past. But the history of this is so incredibly interesting. And the gentleman that was doing the tour that I filmed, it was so informative and in, in what it was back in the time and the seven different terminals that served the Cincinnati area and how they flooded and then how they at that point revolutionized train travel with the different things he explained and simplified this and the fact that that was a vibrant living neighborhood back in the day and the city gave it to the train companies to use. One of the requirements was that the fountain had to remain open and easy access and it still is today because that's where the kids and the families all kind of gathered and the kids played in the fountain. One of the things I think is interesting is this day, although you didn't get a train there, you actually ended up catching a heritage unit in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And on your drive home, you followed it and managed to catch the same heritage unit several other times on your entire way back to Chattanooga. It just happened to be riding on the correct track where you could get it multiple times. This was interesting to edit because we knew the old cars would resonate with people. And I'm a car person. I love old cars. We wanted to try and get this, but to get it in a way that moves the story along, we ended up fast forwarding through a lot of this footage, but it was, uh, it was an interesting old part, especially during the old military truck in the background. This one, this was a serious video. This was the chase of the Southern. We love the Southern because it's important to us for the history of the Southern Railway, which is part of Chattanooga's history and Norfolk Southern's history. So for Chattanooga's, the Southern may be the single most important locomotive that's on the, on the tracks. But this was also an interesting thing because you went and filmed the DeButts yard at Coffee's Cliff, a place where we often hang out. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to have some really interesting footage and angles, and you went ahead and filmed them breaking down and doing a classification of a very long train where the Southern was the leading locomotive. This is one that's very memorable for me because this particular video, the very first clip of it was shot shortly after it had been repainted from its uh, landslide accident up in Pennsylvania. And we had caught it recently back in service. But then looking into the history, and again, that's a lot of what I find so fascinating with all of this, is the history of the yard. Some of the buildings are still there, but what the Southern actually represents for us in our area, and the fact that it originally was painted here in Chattanooga. That day is, was really where I started feeling what a heritage was and son Casey and I learned more about it and not too long before I had discovered the heritage app so that we knew when something might be coming and while I was up in Cincinnati that's when we started that the first chase that probably a 400 mile full day long uh, point but this was was really a, a one of my most memorable ones and we caught a special spot right there because I had been playing adult league kickball in that field that you see just there before Historic Ingle Stadium. And I told Mike, I'm seeing a lot of locomotives that are sitting here. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but it turns out as they pass Citico and they're waiting to enter the yard, it is one of the choke points for everything that's entering to Butts. And you can see from this aerial footage just how huge to Butts is. But if you look at the choke point where they sit waiting to enter the yard, you can catch some really interesting stuff there. And we're going to go all the way north to Coffee's Cliff, famous rail fanning spot. You can see the CSX rail that bypasses on the side. Just the scale of this thing. It's a massive yard. And this is not drone footage, this is generated in Google Earth. But we wanted to try and capture just the scale of this thing and communicate where are we, what are we doing, what's happening, and set the stage for the classification of the settings. 
I enjoyed shooting this video. This was also a turning point for us because this is one of the ones where I brought Mike to the studio. I had him sit in this chair where he sits and I say, okay, Mike, here's all the footage we have. Here's what I'm thinking. And he goes through his notes. As you can see, he has pages of notes there. And so we kind of made this together and we talked about our vision for it. And Mike watched a lot of the editing, which we do more now mm -hmm. to make it more cohesive. And I can match up the way that I see it with the way that he filmed it and we can get a better shot. And this is another one of my favorite spots right here is Coffee's Cliff because it's a place that people from all over the country, when they come to Chattanooga, this is a place that they go. And so when you go to watch all the remote control engines and everything coming and going, because again, everything goes through this point that goes through every local lot through Chattanooga uh, going east-west. And at Coffee's Cliff, you don't know if the next person is from Texas, South Carolina, Canada. It's so many different places. I met so many rail fan friends and shared stories and moments. And you don't have to wait for action because it just never ends there. Is this where you met Jesse from Jesse's Trains and Things? I met him through a gentleman by the name of Seth. We happened to meet at a crossing like so many of the people along the time that I've met. And he introduced me. And now Jesse is part of Mike's core network of the Rail Watchers, and he always lets us know when something interesting is coming. Jesse's a young man. His schedule is a little bit more flexible than Mike's, and so a lot of times he'll beat us to the crossing. He also doesn't require sleep yet, and so he'll wake up at the absolute crack of dawn, you know, the 5 a.m. go rush to get a locomotive. And that's a little tough, um, I'd say, at our, at our ages, Mike. I can't even constantly. He's like a bloodhound. He can find a locomotive within 100 miles. It's just amazing. So watch Jesse's Trains and Things. He is much more of a dedicated rail fan. We love the editing. We love the history. But if you want to catch absolutely everything that comes through, mm -hmm. Jesse's Trains and Things is a good way to do it. And then through Jesse, I also met Warren. And they're all here locally. So we share breakfast and we catch up with what's coming and going and let one another know so that we can get the chance to see whatever is coming through our area. And actually, I think Warren was the first person I ever met who was a fan of our channel that I met in person. And um, I met him one evening. For, and we were all oh, it's Cracker Barrel. Barrel. That's right. We were all in. They don't Cracker Barrel after chasing the train. Because we we're fancy like that. I met him. He said, oh, yeah, I really enjoy your old videos. And that was the first time I met anybody in person who'd watched our videos. This video, I wish it performed better. Uh, this was kind of a challenge. This video did not perform as well as I'd hoped it would. But it was a really interesting video. I enjoyed editing it a lot. This was a lot of work. There was a lot of footage. There was a lot of stuff to try and tell about the story and capture the mood. But this was really impactful of you, Mike, and just the gratitude of the people of the area. I don't think it connected as well. And part of it's because some of the keywords that we needed to make it perform well on YouTube's algorithm, we couldn't use. <laughs> and so I think some people didn't discover it, or maybe they were already busy doing Christmas stuff when we released it, which was the week before Christmas Day. But this was, I think, one of my favorite videos that we've done. The Santa Train, and and the work was incredibly busy. And so the once I found out that this existed, and and started with uh, thanks to Jesse, once I found out this existed, and I was like, I want to do this. I want to go. And it was up in Virginia, but just so busy with work, I really didn't get a chance to set up advanced uh, hotel reservations or figure out where it was going to go or exactly what it was all about. So I literally got off work at four o'clock on Friday and headed north to Virginia and took the new filming truck with me that uh, I have. Found a hotel on the way and next thing I knew, I was in the hills in the mountains of Virginia and I checked into a most incredible hotel. So I'm lost. I have no idea where I'm going. I just know that I'm going north and I have a general idea. Jesse had explained to me that there's a tunnel that goes through so it saves about an hour for the train but it cost me an hour so I decided from what he had told me where I was going to start my day and I started making my way north. Quickly I found out there weren't many hotels up there and I found the frontier in St. Paul, Virginia. So that's where I ended up. Got there around 8.30, quarter to 9.00. The gentleman that checked me in asked me why I was there. I told him about the Santa train and that's why I was there. And at that point, he just made me feel at home because that's when I first realized just how intriguing and how special and how unique this opportunity was for me to share because it's something that's been passed on through generations. And the first thing he told me was, 
the grandparents took his parents, then him to the track and how they, they look forward to it every year and just what it meant to him and his family and the community. And I really didn't grasp it at that point. And then I went next door for dinner. The server that I had went through the whole conversation, the same exact thing. And then the, I, my entire next day, once I got to see what it was and I realized it was just one of those things that once you experience it, it never lets go of you and you appreciate what CSX has done and that they still carry that forward. X really, really incredible. I'm going to go with you next year. You had asked me if I wanted to go, but by the time you decided you were going, I was at work in Union City, Georgia, when I said, okay, where do I have to drive? And he said, well, if you can leave tomorrow night after you get through with work, you can come and meet me in Virginia. And I looked at the calendar and I looked at when I would be leaving. And I realized it would be midnight before I arrived and then we'd have to wake up early. I said, you know, I think I'm going to sit this one out. After seeing the footage, there's a lot of me that wishes I had gone, but realistically, I would have been a walking zombie. But next year, I'm going to go. Seeing this picture, that if you go to St. Paul, that is, or in that area, that is one of the most unique, incredible hotels. The Western Front Hotel. The Western Front Hotel. You've got to go up and experience it. Also, the new estate park is right close by, and it's a place where you can off-road and fish. So it's a real, real interesting area. And I'm an off-road guy, so that's exciting to me. We're going to have to take something we'll get off-road. You want to explain to the people why there are two very normal yellow nose CSX locomotives on the front of that? Apparently the night before, there was a drivetrain issue with one of the CSX executive uh, engines. I think it was CSX number two. So in the last moment, they had to come up with two regular road train engines to make sure everything flowed through the next day. So... That's what happened the night before, but it was resilient and it continued without interruption starting at 6 a.m. that morning. Although those two locomotives were pretty dirty because you can see they yanked them right out of service and I didn't even had a chance to wash them. So I know there's somebody at CSX who was just facing their hands over this, but you know what? The train went on, everybody came down, and the mission continued. All right, our next video we put up after that one was a blooper reel. I enjoyed this. I have actually been saving all of these in a folder called bloopers and I've been saving them since the very first day that Mike and I filmed and he didn't realize this. So I enjoyed making this. I made this on my own. I didn't even really tell you until we were almost finished. Oh, and the drone down. Gosh, this one really damaged my drone. It's actually still not the same. I really pounded it into that tree and I had to take it apart. We went to a Mexican restaurant for lunch and I took my drone apart on the table while we were waiting for our food and used a lighter and a multi-tool <laughs> very there at the table and he's got the lighter on to heat the parts up putting them back together it's like is he gonna fly again in case he says, i hope so and it did we had to change the blades on the propellers but it, it did fly again this next one's one of my personal favorites when you meet the police this is an evening I'll remember for a long time. We're in Wrangell, Georgia. It's actually where the excavator, the scene of where the excavator crash occurred. And I'm back at this point and it's late evening and the, there's one train that's gonna come through. And as I'm finishing, I was there the day before as well and the officer didn't like where I was parked. So he had asked me to move the day before. So now I'm back the next day and all of a sudden, the lights come on, and there's one, then two, and then three patrol cars come up from different uh, directions, the city, uh, the sheriff's department, and I'm there with, with four other people that I had met that were real fans, and we were filming the train, but apparently someone had called in that there were five people at the cross and having a fight, and they rolled out everybody, and they surrounded us, and turned out we were just watching the train, but... When they came, they came with a vengeance. And one of the guys there had a foot-long yes. photo lens. I mean, he's holding thousands of dollars of camera equipment, so I have no idea how somebody thought you were fighting. Maybe they saw a tripod and thought you had a stick, or there's no telling, but somebody with very poor eyesight got Mike Hassel. But I love Mike's side eye as he's watching the cops go by. And then the joy of reading your handwriting. One of these days, I'm going to show them what your handwriting looks like. All right, this continues our Heritage Series. This is the Virginian. One of the things Mike really enjoys is when we change the photo from the black and white to color as we capture one of the units. And we're going to color them all in. We're determined we're going to 
to get all of them. All 20 that see the open road, plus the Erie Line one. This was a fun one for me once I realized that I wasn't going to miss him because I knew he was coming. I was all set up. And then a northbound came. And at the same time, he's coming south. And it's like that moment, he's going to be on the other side and I won't catch him. And I got lucky. He had to stop at this right before Varnell. The other train passed. And then as he came into sight, the conductor opened his window and, and said hi to me and waved. And that was really cool. And then he asked you if you get notified when the train yes. coming. So I could catch up with him and keep up with him. He could tell I was excited that I found him. There he is. He's just tucked in behind that northbound. It's a neat little reveal. And he's moving. He's just creeping along. And then he stops for a moment. We never did figure out why he stops. He sits for a moment and then gets clearance. But he's only stationary for what, about five minutes. Yeah, it was not long. Just short of the crossing. And my chats with him, a lot of that got cut out or sped up. But uh, he sits stationary for a minute. And then we hear him rev up and take off. So a really special moment to be able to capture the Virginian coming in to stop and then starting up again. That's neat. All right, Mike, one of the things I want to ask you is what is one of your favorite videos that we have captured that we do not yet have on the channel? And I will make an effort to go and put it on the channel. Well, as, as Casey always picks out, man, Ryan, this is all my different notes from the different ones. So that's a super hard question. And and this is my first podcast ever. And as, as we've talked already, Casey's going to bring me into the 21st century. So... He told me to start thinking about which one is your favorite. And I thought about it, I went through the notes, and then it, it hit me. The Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum excursion to Somerville with the doubleheader steam after about a four or five year absence because between COVID and a bridge that was deemed unsafe for pasture travel over it, they came back this year in 2023 in September and it was their first home down to Somerville. And over the years, I moved here in 93. And over the years, so many different times I've ridden that route as Austin, my son, grew up, who's now 30. And we took that same exact path and shared so many moments. And to that day, to see all the other families, and both on board and the different people that chased it, all the different people that I met at all the different crossings. And it's just, it's just one of those things that just sticks with you. And that, that is my most meaningful one. I think that I've done. I really wish I'd gone along on that one. Uh, one reason why I didn't is I think when you filmed it, I was on a cruise. I think I was on Grand Turk at the moment that you were catching that. And I was messaging you about it. You were trying to send me pictures, but it's difficult to get a picture to go across the Caribbean. On a cell phone even to this day that was an interesting one i'm sad that i missed that for me i think one of my favorites that we haven't put up yet is the bootleggers crossing day mm, that was interesting and that was a a long excursion uh, it was fraught with problems we had forgotten a couple of things i forgot the battery for my dslr camera and my wife had to bring it to us we had we were starving and had not planned to eat and so we had pizza delivered trackside mm. and we were really, really starving by the time that they figured out where we were. I guess we had to pick basically the address of the graveyard that we were parked in front of to get it delivered. And Bootleggers Crossing is, it, we looked up the historical parts of it and we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. The road that used to be there was no longer active. We're across the street and set up next to a, a cemetery. And it was just one of those things that you could feel the past and wondering, what was there and the skeletons of the past and the history of what made that that area what it is or was back at that point. Then we met Buddy the Goat, who had his head stuck in the fence, mm -hmm. which is a whole long story. And we met a number of different rail fan folks that that's their normal Saturday place. They've been coming there for 20 years. We met a resident that, that actually is Buddy the Goat's uh, owner. And he was so nice, he invited us to use his driveway to film anytime. And so his hospitality was so warm and welcoming. But to, and he told us about all the different people over all the years he had met. That's a spot where people go on Saturdays and Sundays to watch. 
And there's also, I met a gentleman who was caretaking the graveyard across the street, and they were very welcoming and said they were more than happy for us to continue filming from that spot, which was great, because where I was looking for legal right of way to set up, and especially fly the drone to where we're not actually on rail property, and the graveyard caretakers were happy to let us film there. That was nice. There also was an older gentleman with a Subaru mic. You want to talk about that one? We have a train that's holding for a, a green, and he decided he wanted to talk and, and catch up and what we were doing, and so he pulled his car onto the track and kind of stopped on the track. And about that point, or about that time, the engineer gave him a, a long blast uh, that for the old boy that was sitting there waiting for the green. And that's a moment I'll remember because he moved quick and it's one of those places you just never want to stop. And if you can imagine just how loud and also how alarming it was to hear a complete full on long blast, that engineer was not happy that this guy was sitting on the tracks as he shouldn't have been. And we were nervous for the man sitting on the tracks and we're trying to get him to move off the tracks. But he was old enough, I think he probably was around the age he shouldn't have been driving, but he definitely should not have been sitting across the tracks. But he almost came out of his skin when that yeah. laid on the horn. And I was a good, not a quarter mile away, but a long ways away, several hundred feet away from you. And it was so loud, even where I was up on the hill of the graveyard, that it made me jump out of my skin. And I can't imagine being dead in front of that locomotive right as he lays under that horn. So what is your favorite video of the ones that we have up on the channel? Oh, Casey, without any question, it's the Santa train. The, the meaning behind it, the all the people that volunteer, what CSX puts into that to keep it alive. And literally everybody I met throughout the day told me about what it meant to their family. And when I looked at the history on it, how it started. And one of the things that that day that was most memorable is I met the owners of Man Farms, produce company, and we're out in the middle of nowhere and, and where many of the stops were. And I'm on filming at a crossing, it's a, a private crossing there, in the middle of this, I found out it's a strawberry field. Another person pulled up because there were people everywhere along the track. And I said, hey, come on over on this side. You know, the view is much better. You got the whole side as he's coming down. And they graciously said, well, that's our side. We own that property as well. And I said, well, oh, in that case, can I join you? <laughs> and, and that's when I met, and they were so nice. And they told me about how their family had done this and they, the, what it meant. And, and that was just, it was just really, really special that to share those moments with another family. And we don't really highlight it in the video, but they are the people putting the coins on the tracks. And that was a tradition in their family. Yes. And when she made one for me and said, Hey, I made one for you too. That just, that just really hit home of all the people that, that 24 hour period that I spent there, what it meant to them. And Casey, since we've started all this, what's your most memorable moment? I think my favorite video that we actually have up has been the one of the Southern. Because for me, that was the most fun to edit, getting all the history in. Even though I had to start over and do it twice, I was so excited to be able to talk about the history of, of my beloved town and Southern Railway that I really enjoyed putting that all in there. And it's also just a beautiful locomotive. It's, uh -huh. it's a very vibrant green and yellow it's very pretty, and it was fun to produce. I think the most emotional, obviously, was the Santa train, but the most fun to put up would have been the Southern, and I'm excited to continue the Heritage Series. All right, Mike, the dog has since left us. She's enjoying her 11th birthday downstairs with my wife, but I've enjoyed this first little podcast with you. And the next one, we won't really talk through our videos. We just wanted to go through some of our favorite moments, and one of the easiest ways to do it is to look at the footage. But we have thousands of hours of train video we're going to be editing for you and we're going to bring more moments. We're trying to produce one a week now that I'm no longer in school. I'm not traveling quite like I was. We have a little bit more time and Mike's job is changing and give him a little bit more time. So we're excited to continue at an even faster pace of bringing you great content here on Round Moments. And for me, I'd like to say thank you for all of the great folks that I've met along the way and, and all the different historical things that people have shared with me and just to share the camaraderie with all of you makes this just so much fun and for what Casey and I get to share in doing this together it's just above and beyond works. So thanks for joining us in the studio this is Mike and Casey signing off for right now from Real Moments. Thanks for watching don't forget Mike's favorite terms like and subscribe. 
And I can get it right now, too. It took a few tries. More than a few. We'll see you next time.